Hello, my soccer universe. Woohoo! Italy made it through the semifinals in rather impressive fashion, merging the new Italy that is super exciting with the old Italy that can grind out the uh, result. I mean, what better news is there for an Italy fan? like me. I have to say that game against Belgium yesterday was probably the best game at this Euro so far. I mean, open play, especially the first half, was just great from both sides, but especially Italy impressed me even more than they have already been. There was always a knock on them. Yeah, you have been playing great, but never against a big team. Well, you knocked out Belgium. And I said it before, I always can see Italy knocking out Belgium. Uh, there is something about that. Uh, so yeah, Thoroughly impressed, very happy, although there was a few downers in there as well that we need to talk about, that I'm not sure how uh, this will pan out going forward. Uh, the other game between Switzerland and Spain, yeah, that was a little bit more of a, a tedious affair to watch, where Spain never really got going, although they had the perfect start. Uh, Switzerland then deserved to get an equalizer, and then, yeah, uh, contentious red card sends the game to penalties and you cannot win two penalty shooters in a row. I only know of two exceptions and I'll let you know about this as well. One was kind of inevitable. Uh, but yeah, Switzerland gave it their all, but Spain in the end was just simply uh, the better team. Um, but I have to say the whole, the way that the evening worked out, it was actually perfect. The first game goes to overtime and penalties, so you get that drama, which is always uh, in a way fun to watch unless you're really for one of these nations. Um, and then the other game is brilliant, but it doesn't go to overtime, so you actually can uh, end the evening at a decent hour. So for me, worked brilliantly on many ways and probably... Yeah, I, I, I agree. I was a little bit more for Switzerland. Uh, I, I just, although, you know, the Austrian in me, I have this theory. Except skiing, pick any sport. And Switzerland is better than Austria. And that annoys, that annoys me. We had football for the longest of times. And then Switzerland became a regular at World Cups and and on somewhere in the... Uh, 90s, especially in the two, 2000s, since then Switzerland is pretty constant and Austria meandering. So yeah, annoys me <laughs> in many ways, but on the other side, uh, I was happy to see Switzerland doing so well as well. Okay, uh, yeah, and then the other thing that uh, dampened the evening um, was of course dodgy refereeing. I have to say that that was the, the one real downer because I think both games by themselves would have worked out brilliantly, but then the referees make decisions that don't really work. And I have to say, especially the re referee for Belgium, Italy, I think was absolutely not good. And yeah, uh, the red card, we have to talk about that. That well, I think that completely changed the complexion of the first game. So let's uh, go to the first game, Switzerland, Spain in St. Petersburg, We are yeah. Covid, Delta variant and all that, because uh, it was not a smart decision to play this in St. Petersburg. And then have full uh, house and also uh, I've seen a, a report where, you know, there were even not only that the, the um, football is being played, but also students can celebrate in masses their graduation and the whole thing is propagating. Nah. Doesn't, not a look good, not... Not a good look, not a look good, not a good look on the Russian authorities and UEFA in addition, especially by kind of forcing that uh, uh, stadiums should open a little bit more. So didn't like that at all. The game, as I said, it started very well for Spain uh, because they get an early on goal through Zakaria where after corner Alba takes a shot, Zakaria wants to clear it and puts it in his own net. If it doesn't interfere, Sommer has the ball, no problem. Uh, Switzerland had a few interesting movements in attack, but it was always either a pass was missing or Shakiri was a little bit too selfish. You know, um, things didn't, didn't work out well and definitely didn't, didn't help that uh, Mbolo needed to come, come off uh, injured as well. Um, and then, you know, without Chaka, didn't look, um, you know, Switzerland really had to dig deep and rely on the depth of their squad. But I have to say, uh, 
there wasn't much coming from Spain because Switzerland kept it tight at the back. I mean, they were playing a 3 4 2 1. So basically, you had seven defensive players, and Spain really had trouble uh, breaking that one down and were never convincing. I mean, uh, the Spain side, I, I heard it this morning, and I, I think it's, it's completely right. Um, they do everything right in many ways. They play the right passes, they, they are technically brilliant, uh, there is a certain uh, attacking patterns, but it is not convincing, it doesn't go forward, it is not, you, you don't have the feeling that there's any danger. Uh, and then especially when it goes to the second half, I thought that uh, despite Spain having, again, loads of possession and, and so on, that Switzerland actually was the more dangerous team. Uh, there was the header by Zakaria, who I would have loved if you could, could, could have made up his uh, own, own goal, his insane goal that just misses a little bit. Then Zuba gets a shot not quite off and then uh, yeah, the Spanish uh, defense implodes. I think Paul Torres uh, yanks the ball on to um, Laporte or the other way around. I, I, I think it was, no, Laporte, I think onto uh, Torres, then the ball goes to Froila who plays it over to Shakiri and it's 1-1. And I think at that point, Switzerland got kind of the upper hand. And if it wasn't for a really contentious red card, yes, Froila comes too late. Uh, and the trailing leg takes out Moreno, who had come on for Morata, who again didn't show a thing. Uh, and uh, if you look at the uh, changes that, um, that that they made, I mean, the whole front line had to come off. In many ways, they were uh, all the changes in Spain were all offensive except for Pau Torres, uh, who was <laughs> later exchanged. Um, but other than that, all offensive chain changes. Um, and Gerard Moreno came on and made, you know, had some danger, especially then in overtime. But I think uh, his first contribution was actually being the recipient of that foul. I can see it's, an it's dangerous play and it's probably on the, um, on the edge. But I think to me it was still more yellow than red. Yes, Freyla come, comes late. That kind of really, really changed the game. Because at that point then Freyla... Um, you have a defensive present that uh, needs to uh, that that came came, came off and saw Swiss Swiss and even dug deeper in uh, with now eight defensive ones and all the ones let's go to penalties. And Spain was especially I think the first half of, of overtime they had so many chance, chances especially Moreno I think twice uh, uh, there, there, there was one where. Uh, point blank shot but whenever they take a shot it was always at the center of goal it was a good shot it was uh with uh thunder but it was always towards the center so uh while well, summer made the good saves a different goalkeeper probably would, 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 would have conceded but it was not difficult in any way for him i mean he just had to have good positioning and he saved it and so the longer the, the overtime went the more i thought yeah it's inevitable it goes to penalties and that was all that switzerland was hoping for and given the penalty record of Spain, I think having missed six in a row up until that point, Busquets made it seven, although Spain started. And then Gavranovic scores, and you think that Switzerland can, can, can pull off another one. However, then the real curse comes. I can only remember two teams that won two penalty shoes in a row. Croatia in 2018, but this was inevitable because uh, Russia went through penalties and Croatia went through penalties. So it was inevitable that one of those two um, will win a penalty shoot shooter. So uh, that probably was not the big one. Uh, the only other one was Argentina in 1990, first Yugoslavia and then Italy. Uh, that was probably the best goal, uh, uh, the best goalkeeping, and, you know, but the best penalty shooting performance of all time. And so Switzerland is also again hit by that curse Despite having the, 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 the advantage, uh, when Olmo then makes it 1-1, Cher misses and then all the Swiss players miss. Uh, Un Simons saves two and um, Sommer actually then makes another save. When Cher misses, uh, Rodri misses. Uh, but then Moreno puts them in the lead and Vargas puts it over the bar. And then the easiest penalty is the one to win a penalty shootout. When you really cannot lose and Oyar Sabal puts Spain through. Hard work, hard work. I think that on balance, Spain was the better team. However, I had this feeling without the red card, there was a good chance that Switzerland might have uh, dealt Spain the killer blow. I always had that. It was always teetering there. Now, going to the other game. Belgium, Italy, I said it in the run-up. 
this was a wonderful game. Uh, absolutely, you, I could not take my eyes off it. I knew there was something happening. I thought that in the first exchange you could see that Belgium was physically more dominant than Italy. I mean, if you saw a Belgian player and an Italian player, uh, the Belgians should seem just bigger. Maybe also down to the red jerseys. And yes, I'm wearing white Italy. Why cannot Italy play in blue? Why? This was the one thing that, uh, that, that was the last thing that uh, damped, damped the spirit that we saw these ugly away jerseys when you could have these. Anyway, that was the only bad thing uh, about the Italian performances and an injury lay, lay, later on. But um, Italy got themselves into the game. Yes, I really think that at, in, in the early exchange, I think Italy had more possession, tried to control the midfield and also especially with the left side with um, Spinazzola and Insigne, they really tried to uh, cause a whole lot of trouble. However, Belgium, when they hit the counter, it always seemed dangerous. It was exemplified by the great job by um, De Bruyne, where Don Donnarumma, Donnarumma had to make his first save. I keep calling him not Donnarumma. He uh, doesn't deserve any better than that. Uh, but then also, uh, Bonucci had already given Italy uh, the lead after, I think it was a free kick, but Di Lorenzo touches it with his um, uh, knee kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of and then uh, goes on the belly of, Kiel, of uh, Bonucci. And in the internet, which was offside, unfortunately. However, I thought at that point, yeah, hmm, interesting. Uh, Italy scores, although I find Belgium a slightly more dangerous, not the better, but the more dangerous team at that point. Uh, especially this Lukaku guy, and I think the decision to have Chiellini and Bonucci playing was exactly to neutralize Lukaku, because that's what Juve has been doing all season long. Lukaku was in good hands with Bonucci and Chiellini, and I think they, they, this was why they, they, were, they were playing, although I actually would prefer a slightly different centre-back pairing, but they played brilliantly yesterday, I have to say. Uh, almost a key scene in the 20th and 21st when both Verratti and Tillemans, within a minute of each other, both got ye yellow cards, and this was kind of, you know, um, the working bees in midfield for those. And you could see then later on this affected Tillemans quite, quite a bit. Uh, the Italians also in gamesmanship really upped their game. Uh, the goal for Italy, the first one, there was uh, Immobile, who was really immobile the whole game. I mean, he had a great work rate, but other than that, he didn't add any quality to, to the game. But I think he was instrumental to the first goal. Because he's in the box, um, gets a knock and just lies down. And you can see how the Belgians are frustrated with it. Vermalen kind of saying, come on, get up. But he is not concentrated. The ball goes to Vertonghen and the Italians with a great counter press. Get the ball. Uh, Verratti plays it to Barella, who now Vermalen was totally annoyed with um, Immobile. And just lost a point of concentration, and at that point, uh, Barella then can go through all three fans with a wonderful shot, makes it 1 0 Italy. And you could see in the re uh, they, they show in German TV in the replay that how Immobile is lying Immobile on the floor. Um, then the goal is scored, and you see, hmm, look up, okay, I can get up, I can celebrate. <laughs> it was, they were hilarious. And this is, I, I mean, I love game, I really love gamesmanship like, like that because it worked to a T. And with that goal, Italy took control of the game uh, and were by far the better side. This was super impressive. This was a game that from individual um, brilliance, especially Insigne, but also De Bruyne or Doku, who I haven't mentioned it, who came in for Azar, but was every was super impressive i mean whenever he had had the ball you had the feeling that uh italy is shaking you had uh barrel and case on the right or right side actually didn't do as much as uh especially spinazzola and insignia on the left this was really really impressive what the old also did insignia uh, had a shot before where he kind of pulled, pulled it over and then he gets the ball uh in his own half carries it carries forward goes towards goal tillemans can stop him However, since he's already on yellow, he doesn't do it and lets him pass. And then when you see Alderweireld, uh, Vermalen and Vertonghen, no one is really attacking Insigne. What's even worse, Alderweireld puts his uh, hands behind the back, although he's clearly not in the box. He lets Insigne shoot 
and he finds a wonderful shot. I mean, that shot is not easy. Wonderful curl shot, 2-0 Italy, and I'm thinking that's the game. However, the referee decided to make a game out of it again. Uh, Di Lorenzo against Doku. I think it's a regular tussle. Yes, there's a little shove, but how often have you seen shoves in a penalty box? He decides to give a penalty. And of course, it's not uh, that. That clear for wrong decision. To me, this was not a penalty. Absolutely, 100% not. Lukaku steps up. It's 1-2. Setting up an uh, interesting second half. I think in the second half, Italy continued the don't, 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 don't domination, but didn't uh, convert their chances. I mean, they had quite a few chances where I thought with a little bit more precision or, or so, you can take a shot. There was always a, a, a foot or whatever in between. But, and, and, and I was saying, say, 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 saying to my wife, I think Italy needs to make a third third goal because Belgium might well score and they might have well done that because Doku really nicely allows De Bruyne to get some space. De Bruyne, uh, uh, the ball comes to De Bruyne who plays it across the goal goal mode where Lukaku just needs to put his foot in and not score because Spidatolo gets his butt in there. And then uh, the, re the rebound also. Everyone celebrating for the Italian. Did they celebrate as much this defensive part of Spinazzola as they celebrated the goals? And from that moment on, you knew kind of this Italy team is very united. They are working to it together. They are digging in. And you know, I mean, Chiellini uh, and Bonucci love that kind of stuff to just frustrate opponents out there. Then there was another huge chance where uh, the ball, I think it was again uh, Doku plays a ball in that gets the kind of um, by the by, by Lorenzo uh, at the deflection. So it goes just over Lukaku's head. And then Torgan Azar is right there. And with his, he wants to back heal it and pull, pull, pulls it out. Those were the big chances for, for Belgium. And then Italy could play, uh, play at home rather safe. However, um, no, it was Chadley who actually made the, the cross. Chadley who came on and then had to come, come off in an injury. And then a little bit later, Spinazzola, pro, it, well, what I read is probably an Achilles tear. He had, I mean, acres of space. He wants to run, run through and then just suddenly, bang, it goes. And that uh, he was probably the best player for Italy at this Tour to tournament. And I'm wondering how, how this will look like going forward. Then Italy plays it home safely. I have to say the referee, uh, he once did not see a foul on Belotti in midfield and he gives a free kick to De Bruyne. Uh, but Italy played that stoppage time rather, rather safe and got, 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 got home in the old-style Italian way. So the first half and most of the second half, really the new Italy trying to move it forward. But when it really got uh, to the nitty-gritty, they ground out there the result. I have to say, Italy looked really, really impressive. And so, with Italy against Spain, I semi-final that I, I mean, yes, from what, 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 what we've seen, Italy should be the favorites. Uh, we'll look at the uh, red, 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 so far, but just, just, just from looking, it should be favorites. However, I think that the Spain team will have a much easier task against an op more open side like Italy is. So. I'm curious how this will go moving forward. Um, I hope that Italy will make it. Everyone knows that. Everyone knows that who will watch it, that I'm falling hard for the Azuri in this one. And I think they're the best team still in the competition. But let's see how it will go. I think that the Spain side can hurt Italy if they don't implode themselves defensively and if they can score up front, which they've proven they can. But Italy will not give you that many opportunities. As for projections, you see uh, Italy is now the slain the Belgian dragon. Uh, they are now favored to go to the final and they're favored, of course, over uh, Spain. England still in control of that one, thanks to home field advantage. As for overall win percentage, the Italy, Spain already made it to the semifinals. They, of course, move ahead of England um, to be now in first and second. That might well change if England now moves on, then they will be the big favorites. However, I, you can see it already. I mean, 22% for England, despite not being a knockout, is almost the same as Spain. So tell that tells you how much England is favored, uh, at least rating-wise, with home field advantage going on. 
So, I've talked about England. We have two games today, the Czech Republic against Denmark and Ukraine against England. Not the biggest matches, but I think the Denmark game uh, is intriguing because I really want to see how Denmark will play and whether England will again play rather defensively or will they attack against Ukraine. I'm also curious, will we see yellow versus white or yellow versus blue? I hope for the latter one, to be honest. And with the first semi-final in at Wembley between Italy and Spain. So yeah, it was a great evening yesterday. I thoroughly enjoyed uh, both games, especially then when it went second half in Switzerland. And the Belgium-Italy game, as I said, it was the best game that we've seen so far uh, with only dodgy refereeing and the Italian jerseys being a little bit a disappointment there. Let me know your thoughts on this semi-final. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey, just in case you enjoyed this video, here are some videos and playlists that you actually might enjoy too. Also, please consider following me on social media and actually subscribe to my channel so that you stay up to with everything that happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.